amazing. Thank you, Awesome, for that introduction. So first, I apologize in advance for my voice. I sound a little froggy. October is homecoming month in the AUC, so we've had three back-to-back -back homecomings. And uh, not even two weeks ago, the weather there was in the 70s and 80s. So we're still dealing with allergens in the air. Then I transition here to the cold, the frigidness. So my voice is a little hoarse, so I apologize in advance. But I will start with a, extending my gratitude to Awesome India and Marika and the whole TCIA team. It's a tremendous honor to be here for my first D4 PG conference. And I'm looking forward to being a part of the future iterations of this co-powering initiative. And thanks also to my longtime good friend and colleague, Dr. Walter Grayson, um, for connecting me to such an authentic group of people and their vital vision. Dr. Grayson and I went to graduate school together at Temple University. He was in the history department and I was in the English department. And I think we also kind of ad adopted Africana studies as well. <laughs> so my remarks today are entitled Aspirations of an Afrofuturist Educator, Creating and Imagining Black Futures Through Visionary Literature. And I'm gonna begin with two things not mentioned in the introduction. The first is where I started my academic career. And I don't just mean the physical location of a pretty good sized state, predominantly white institution in South Jersey, but also where I located myself in an intellectual and professional capacity. The second, and I've said this already, I'm a mother of twins. Um, Quincy and Maurice, who are 10 years old. And I believe my family is online, so hi. <laughs> so I start with these two bits of information because they are emblematic of my deep-seated connection with Afrofuturism and the shape that it takes in my work. You'll see in these first two blocks in the slide here, the definition of Afrofuturism that comes from the book entitled Afrofuturism, The World of Black Sci-Fi and Fantasy Culture by Yatasha Womack, who's also a CAU alum, by the way. <laughs> so Womack defines Afrofuturism as the intersection of imagination, technology, the future, and liberation. It's reimagining and re-envisioning the past, present, and future through a Black lens. And it shows up in my work as an avenue for the exploration of Black identity and artistic aesthetic, a tool for cultural analysis and production, and a platform for scrutinizing the impact of technologies on cultural communities. As an Afrofuturist educator, I recognize that the future is inextricably linked to the past. I'm always thinking about how to connect my students with their historical heritage while keeping them grounded and rooted in the present and oriented towards the future. The theme for this conference, co-powering for an emergent horizon is so timely for me because not only do I have a captive audience <laughs> for, uh, for what's about to be ge me geeking out up here, but it's also an opportunity to examine the multiple intersections of Afrofuturism. And I'm talking about those between the activists, the artist, and the educator, and the students, I would add, between the past, the present, and the future, between ancestral wisdom futuristic technologies, and the richness of Black diasporic experiences. This is the aspiration of the Afrofuturist educator, and it's to co-power students to celebrate their history and envision a future where Black voices, cultures, and visions take center stage. So that's the broad perspective, and the rest of the presentation is going to dig down into some of the finer details. So. I bring greetings 
from Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. You may have heard of it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so here are some facts about the college. So it's one of six HBCUs in the AUC, Morehouse, Spelman, Clark Atlanta University, my alma mater, Morris Brown, an interdenominational theological center and Morehouse School of Medicine. It's a private men's college. It's the largest men's liberal arts college in the US. The Alma Mata, it's the Alma Mata of many black civil rights and political leaders, including Martin Luther King Jr., Julian Bond, and Raphael, Raphael Warnock, as well as entertainment icons like Spike Lee and Samuel Jackson. Morehouse alum, known as Morehouse Men, include numerous Black firsts in local, state, and federal government, as well as in science, academia, business, and entertainment. Its mission is to develop men with disciplined minds who will lead lives of leadership and service. So while I'm here representing Morehouse College, my career didn't start here. That mid-sized state PWI in South Jersey was my first tenure track position. I was there for 12 years and I was just out of grad school. I was hired to be the specialist in African-American literature and to help the newly launched efforts to develop the Africana Studies program it was have we were trying to have a major and a minor. Basically, we were trying to become a department. And I loved my job. It was a place where I was to define myself as a budding scholar and teacher. I taught classes that I developed on my own, like 19th century women radicals, the Harlem Renaissance, Toni Morrison, African American literature, one and two, and black science fiction and fantasy. Not to mention, eventually, the major in Africana Studies, which was going along at a progressive rate, it became um, a program, and I became the co-chair of, of, the, of the department during my last years there. I even had my own radio show. <laughs> it was called The African American Profile with Dr. Tanya Clark. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> However, it wasn't until I took a junior sabbatical during my third year of working at the university that I had an epiphany. During my leave of absence, all things African-American literature and culture related in my department stopped. Nothing being taught, nothing being planned, nothing being even tangentially considered for intellectual pursuits. This eye-opening moment, I say it's the, the moment when the honeymoon was over. <laughs> it, I came to realize that I wasn't teaching a legacy. I was teaching a curriculum, right? I was teaching through the wrong lenses. I was relying on the narratives that I had been given in graduate school colonization, slavery, imperialism, trauma. I mean, what is a syllabus if it's not a linear checklist of someone else's canon? Structuralism, feminism, Marxism, psychoanalysis, and my personal favorite, deconstruction. Those were the theories that were privileged, while more culturally based perspectives, such as womanism and black feminism, cultural studies, Pan-Africanism and African-American literary theory were relegated to the margins of my graduate studies. Consider this analogy, and I think um, it'll go over well given this context. If you think of my classes at the time as data going in or dominant narrative going in, misinformation, misunderstanding was going out. So I began to think, who was I putting out into the world and what was I preparing them for? And I began to ask myself, what shall I teach them? Right, Which is the question of the Afrofuturist educator. So 
the mother of twins part, right? I'm supposed to say it like Daenerys Targaryen would say it. I'm the mother of twins, <laughs> right? <laughs> I bring them up because through them, my own past, present, and future have collided in ways that only make sense when you view them through an Afrofuturist lens. So this slide represents my past, present, and future. The far left, <laughs> that's me graduating from Clark Atlanta with my BA in English. <laughs> in the middle is my present. It's me and a group of my students from my Blacks in Wonderland class. And then on the, the far end, the future, that's Quincy and Maurice. So Quincy is the one like this on the left. <laughs> and Maurice is the one who is holding the cat, right? That's Kitty. He goes with us everywhere. <laughs> so they're my future, right? We were visiting the MLA Center, the MLK Center, and their shirts say, young black boy on the road to Morehouse. So what convergences do you see here? Right, the AUC, remember where Morehouse, Spelman, Clark, Atlanta are right across the street from one another, right? They have always played a major role in my life growing up in Decatur, which is about 30 minutes outside of Atlanta. Just last night, we were talking, we were talking about the Freak Nick and how grateful I am that that documentary is starting after I was already gone. <laughs> right? Education is another commonality. So I'm graduating from college. I'm teaching college students. My sons are already thinking about their pathway to college. And of course, because of where we are, the prominence of Blackness in the history of Black life and culture is another convergence. And also, I would say Afrofuturism itself, right? Yatasha Womack, as a graduate of Clark Atlanta, me in the middle there teaching Afrofuturist um, texts, and then the my sons already kind of thinking about how they're going to make it to Morehouse, to their own futures. So this time, when it, so when I returned home and returned to the AUC, this time with kids in tow, I began again to ask myself, what shall I teach them? Only this time that them not only meant my students, but it also meant the young black boys that I was raising. Well, there's supposed to be a really big, pretty circle here with the name, but I guess that didn't come through. That's okay, right? But as much as I want to claim the term Afrofuturist educator as my own, it's not. It comes from Deirdre Hallman, professor and former director of education and exhibitions at the Schomburg Center in Harlem, New York. And her essay is in the anthology, Cosmic Underground, and it's called, What Shall I Teach Them? Musings of an Afrofuturist Educator. And that essay brilliantly captures the pre-semester angst that I always have um, when I am planning my classes. What am I going to teach them? What do I need to unteach them? What, I'm gonna, what am I gonna have to reteach them? And she writes, I wonder how I can enrich them, nourish them, encourage them to traverse into adulthood without falling prey to the trappings of our dystopian reality. They must be aware of the traps, right? Read that as good data. They must be aware of the traps. Read that as data, right? Bad data, misinformation going in. The textbooks, the television shows, the clothing lines, the radio stations, the fairy tales, the census data, the police reports, the singular vocabulary, the hair products, the factory jobs, the emojis, the smog, the credit scores, all the manufactured images they experience that corrupt their sense of who they are. 
Their black bodies are negated by the traps, distorted and disqualified by the traps, fractured by the traps, deadened by the traps. To answer these questions, I had to delve back into my own past and restart with the co-powering institutions whose lessons of heritage and survival had been intellectualized out of me by the unsupportive, isolated, self-aggregating environment called graduate school. <laughs> the first place of nurturing, safety, healing was Clark Atlanta and the AUC, where I learned about writers like James Baldwin, Octavia Butler, and Toni Morrison. And the other was the Mellon Mays program, which is a pipeline program for students at HBCUs who wanted to go on to graduate school and teach in the academy. They taught me how to conduct graduate school level research and to write theoretically based arguments. And what I realized is that I had forgotten my ability to speculate, right? If you were here yesterday, Michael Dando told us what speculating means, right? The act of forming opinions, making educated guesses, drawing inferences, exploring possibilities. And what drives speculation is curiosity, right? It sounds a lot like critical thinking, reading, and writing. <laughs> So how do we return to or start to ask the what if questions? Understanding Afrofuturism as a, as a epistemological means to black survival is a good start. Well, what does that mean, right? So we must go, we must begin to envision Afrofuturism as a way to enter conversations about what knowledge is. What do we need to know? How do we need to know? No. What are the sources of that knowledge? What are the limitations of that knowledge? I pour into my students that they must develop the critical reading, thinking, and writing skills that will open up their imaginative and creative forces and make them imagine and create pathways to their survival in the future, to affirm how they will survive in the future, not if they will survive. So lucky for you, all my little colorful things aren't showing up, but that's okay. I got the picture in there. <laughs> so lucky for you, I have a formula for, and I've adopted this term here because I love it so much, a formula for co-powering. And this is how I approach my own teaching and learning. And I wanna point out that I've used um, the Hallman essay and the collection Octavius Brood, Octavius Brood Science Fiction Stories from Social Justice Movements to help me flesh out this, this, uh, this formula. So the first part, we are inalienable, right? That's the visionary fiction. Think about it. It means we are unable to be alienated from ourselves who we were, who we are, and who we will become, right? Visionary speculative fiction, right? Has relevance towards building new freer worlds with an arc always bending towards justice. It's conscious of intersecting identities and it centers on those who have been marginalized. So you think, in what areas is the bad data, the bad narratives going in, right? How is it being circulated? Is it AI, predictive analytics, social media? Use your speculative vision and voices, right? To write the visionary fiction that will show a pathway to change those narratives. The next is, we will survive. That's emergent strategies. Those are plans, plans toward change that is not linear, hierarchical, outcome-oriented, or unyielding. 
that one has really changed my approach. I, despite what you might be seeing here now, I, I don't lecture, right? I, it's no longer about me giving students knowledge, but an exchange and me learning from them just as much as they learn from me. And then lastly, we have, we have collective power and that's networking. And by that, I mean effective mentorship and communication, collaborative ideation, collective power, group work, which we do a lot of in my classes, study groups. One of the best pieces of information I got as an undergrad was from Dr. Asa Hilliard, an Africanist centered educational psychologist. And he said, and I have a slide with some other nuggets from his lecture in 91. He says, get a study group, form a study group. Dr. Grayson and I and others at Temple, we were always at the knee of Dr. Norman, one of our mentors. And we were, as much as we were socializing, we were also working, we were reading, we were collaborating with our ideas and our thoughts. So that's your formula. And after the formula, you need materials, right? So where do I start? <laughs> so this is Yatasha Womack's cover of Afrofuturism, right? And I'm not gonna go through the whole list, but I'll just point out some, some doozies. <laughs> so Dark Matter, a century of speculative fiction from the African diaspora, the first collection of black speculative fiction and essays. And there are some good ones in there. So there's The stories are good, but there are good essays that you need to know if you want to understand the history of blacks in relationship to science fiction and fantasy, right? There's um, Why Blacks Should Read and Write Science Fiction by Charles Saunders, Black to the Future by Walter Mosley, and The Monophobic Response by Octavia Butler right, which is an essay that will change your life and blow your mind, right? She talks about the need for humankind to create aliens, right? So because of an intrinsic fear of being alone, but in creating the aliens, right? Because there are no real aliens, right? The aliens are the other. And as we other them, right, then we do a disservice not only to them, but to ourselves also. Also on the list, did y'all know that Du Bois, that w, the W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a speculative story, right? It's called The Comet. We know him as a sociologist and a thinker and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, an academic and an intellectual, but he was a creative writer too, The Comet. Um, uh, uh, Pauline Hopkins is who I study uh, for my dissertation. Sam Delaney, he's tough, but once you once you <laughs> once you crack that shell, you'll appreciate him. And then basically anything by Octavia Butler. <laughs> and then I have some contemporary writers. I said I wasn't going to go through the whole list, but then I did it anyway. And then I have some contemporary writers. Um, Annette Akor for in her Binti series, and uh, N.K. Jemison, who's another hard one, but again, once you get once you once you get it, I would suggest starting with How Long Till Black Future Month. Those is a collection of short stories. So after the material, you need inspiration. So here, so Dr. Hilliard came to speak at Clark Atlanta University when I was a sophomore in college. And they have this speech in the archives at our library. And he gave us these, these are the little nuggets that I remember. Well, I didn't really remember that. I went back to the film and watched it. <laughs> but I do remember being there, okay? Because my mentor, Dr. Lydell, didn't give me a choice. So he says, your mission as a college student is higher than getting a job. And I'll pause there for a moment, right? You have to do two things, study, 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 and plan, plan, plan. And just after that was his comment about getting into study groups. 
right? He says, and this is before Afrofuturism, the term wasn't coined until 1994, 1993, 94, right? He says, your future in this country depends on whether somebody respects that continent, meaning Africa. If they don't respect that continent, then they'll never respect you. Okay, I have to just say this as an English person. It, it you know, these little typos, I did do my proofreading. All right, they're just coming up differently on this uh, on, on this format for some reason, but yes, I had to point that out. <laughs> then he says, I look to the past in order to see the future. And then it's impossible to continue to oppress a consciously historical people, right? So if you're grounded, and that's by John Henry Clark, if you're grounded in where you've been and you are oriented in your present using that past, right? Then your future is, is guaranteed. And then lastly, much of what you're gonna read in America is going to be inappropriate and racist. What you have to come to all books with is a critical perspective. And you get that critical perspective by developing an awareness that doesn't depend on that book or any other book. Then you can read any book you want and your critical mind will tell you to sift through the falsehoods. What if that, what is that if it's not speculative? This was 91, I was a sophomore in college. And I'm gonna leave you with that. I think my time is up. Okay, so I have plenty of time we have plenty of time for questions. And I have my contact information here. I um, included my LinkedIn. I'm trying to do better. <laughs> yes. Oh. Hold it. Hands up. <laughs> I will say we have a special comment from the live QCO chat. Hi, mom. Oh. <laughs> Hi, boys. <laughs> um, so you your reading list included NK Jonathan, which I love. Um, and also you kind of framed uh some of your inquiries into the question of what shall I teach them. Um, and this is kind of a follow-up on that, right? One of the theses of of NK Jemison's Broken Earth trilogy is this idea that marginalized people's skills, talents, innate strength can be weaponized against them or reclaimed to re-empower them, us, whoever, right? Um, what do you see, what in, in this educational career, what are those strengths, skills, abilities, powers that you see in your students that you are seeking to raise up in that pedagogical framework? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. So my students have a tremendous capacity to imagine. Okay. So we we start there and it's it's and I and I that's what I try to pull out in them. So whenever we approach any uh any one of the science fiction Afrofuturist stories that that we go over, we delve into, of course, literary traditions, right? So plot, characterization, theme, symbolism. But then we always spend some time thinking about what those themes or what those ideas look like in the real world, in their own lives. Um, one of the things that Walter Mosley says in his essay, Blacks to the Future, is that unfortunately, we didn't see ourselves as people of color being able to write in the curriculum of science fiction and fantasy because we didn't have time or energy or, 
or even just the privilege to, uh, to create and to think about problems or to think about issues kind of beyond what we have to do to survive in an everyday world. So I tap into that. I try to tap into what they already know about what it means to, to and I don't want to just say struggle, but to live as young Black men in America, right? And so they know these things. They might not always be able to articulate it. They may not always be able to ask for what they need, but when we are able to kind of mesh uh, the creative writing, and we also do that as well. For example, we uh, there's a story where they rewrite the ending to one of our to one of the stories that we read um, in virtual reality in the the um, lesson that is about horror. We start out with what are what does what is your what are the things that scare you, right? If we think about black horror, then we're thinking about the ways in which we are able to articulate our fears in, um, in living through American society. So I'm trying to pull out in them the their innate abilities to create and to think and to have confidence in that, right? Because um, a lot of times as Black males, they've been given the data of can't, right? And unable to. So there's a lot of unteaching and unlearning that I have to do just towards the, you know, in the beginning parts of the semester. Um, and the, the visionary fiction, the speculative fiction, it helps us uh, quite a bit to unpack those emotions and those, and those feelings while also building on those skills. All right, thank you. Can we see hands again? We got distracted. Other questions from the audience? Oh, we have one over here. Okay. So when you say Afrofuturism and you think about the broader collective of the multicultural context of America, how do you want it to resonate? You know, when, if I had to explain it, you know, from a, a, a bicultural lens, how do you want that to be transferred based on how you know your approach to the work? Right. So kind of honing in on your uh, term bicultural lens, right? So I believe that when we open up literature to all audiences and this idea that we can write in collaboration, that we can work in collaboration, that everybody everybody benefits from that. Everybody benefits from the sharing of ideas, the sharing of experiences, the sharing of fears. And so, although I'm rooted at the HBCU in Black culture, one thing that I think that people People don't always realize about HBCUs is there is a great amount of diversity there. We have Blacks from across the diaspora. So I'm not just talking about American Blacks, and my um, class covers the, the, the subtitle of the course is um, Fiction and Film from the African Diaspora. So we cover works by not just African American writers. Um, and so when I open up this body of literature, I am extending it because remember this journey to Afrofuturism started when I was at New Jersey at a PWI. And so I was primarily teaching white students about black culture and black literature. And so it was still the same level of rigor and exchange of ideas but what I came to realize was that I wasn't providing them with the arc that let them know the longevity or the historical value, right? But only to kind of see that body of work as it presented itself in the literature, in the criticism, in that moment, right? So I wasn't making the full connection. 
And I think that that was where um, I had to kind of rethink how I was gonna approach teaching and how I was gonna approach learning. And so um, multicultural for me, right? Although it starts, you know, as an African-American at an HBCU, that's where it starts, but it's uh, certainly one that is branched out and for everyone. I have a question if that's okay. Sure. <laughs> uh, so I'm curious, um, if AI was to eat Afrofuturism for breakfast, <laughs> what would it produce? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it would produce maybe something that is a cross between, um, let me see, a cross between like an activist and a creative, right? So I'm thinking um, a, 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 a someone like Octavia Butler, um, and then we have the creative arts and the visual arts and the digital arts. So I'm thinking, you know, a John Jennings and uh, let's see, and then and a, and a thinker, right, an activist. Um, so yeah, I think it would come out as this kind of hybrid um, because there is no one way to approach Afrofuturism, and I think I was in one of the workshops yesterday, and uh, the young man, your student, uh, Bryson, Bryson Berry, um, pointed out that Afrofuturism means a lot of different things in different fields, um, in different arenas, and he did this wonderful presentation about Afrofuturist um, architecture and urban planning. Right, and so it would it would it would be a mix of of all things um, that would kind of, but it would all be kind of centered in the historical narratives of um, people of color, people of African descent. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> No answer. <laughs> I would have to feed it to the AI to be able to find out. It's all speculation, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> Do you mind if I ask a question of the audience? And uh, Dr. Clark, would you be okay going back to your list of those books? Sure. I'm really curious with this audience, how many of you are familiar with these readings? If you know at least one of the titles on this list, and this is not, this is an opportunity, even if you don't know, so there's no shaming in it, but we just really want to understand what has exposure been like to Afrofuturism and this in the, in this canon. Can you show a uh, show of hands if you know at least one of the titles on this list and have you don't even have to have read it? Do you know it? This is good. This is a good crowd. That is okay. Good. That is good. What about five of the titles on there? To be expected, to be expected. Very good. Okay. All of them. So <laughs> what a wonderful opportunity for a study group. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm thinking now about the uh, 2024 kind of iteration of this, and it doesn't have to it doesn't have to just wait until 2024 when we can come together as a group. We, there's this lovely thing called Zoom, right? <laughs> Where we can have these study groups together. I'm happy. This is what I love to do. I love to talk about literature. Um, so I would be happy to lead study groups. I'm in a book club um, with my mom and uh, several other women. And and I enjoy very much the uh, the pleasure that that brings to me. And if I can impart that in any way with this stuff, that's I would love to. Yeah, is this on? It's on. Hello, um, I'm from Fargo, North Dakota, and we um, 
the kids there don't really know a lot about Afrofuturism at all. The reason I know that is because we just had our fourth annual Juneteenth and Afrofuturism was a theme and it was executed very well, but it, I could tell it was very new to the audience. Um, so I'm interested in like you're saying the deep programming that is necessary in order to like fully interpret this speculative nature and like <laughs> enjoy these readings and stuff like that. So can you speak a little bit about how you might help some younger kids deep program in white homogenous spaces? Cause that I would love to bring like, I love to bring a reading club and stuff like that. But um, for like a younger audience, how would you deep program basically? Thank, yes, thank you for that. And um, that reminds me to point out that I do have, this is a kind of excerpted version of my starter kit to Afrofuturism. And I'm happy to make the longer piece available um, to Awesome and to Dr. Grayson so that it can distribute it out to, um, to the McAllister and, uh, campus and beyond. Um, but I would say that you you first have to start where they are, okay, and to listen, right, and to lit and to listen to them. You said they were how old, what grade, or did you say? Well, I like I just saw a lot of like middle schoolers and high schoolers just not oh, even know. Okay, a lot okay. About that, so. Start from where they are. Ask them, right? What have you? How, what have you been taught in school? What do you know about history subject X, Y, or Z? Um, what do you know about Juneteenth? What did you, if you were at the, the Juneteenth celebration, what did you observe? What seemed to come out as uh, the main theme or the purpose of this rally and how did it resonate with you, right? So one thing that we tend to do is think that, uh, children, young people are in incapable of um, articulate thought, right? There's a lot of ideas going on and you should start from where they are and just ask them and listen. And then from there, you know, they'll, they'll tell you what they think is missing, where the gaps are, what they don't understand. And then you hit the library right? And you find the research that will help kind of build them back up, right? So the first thing to do to help them manage the, um, the isolation, the ostracization that they might, of their culture that they might be feeling because of the spaces that they're in. And here's the thing, if it's where they live, it's, if it's where they go to school, they can't necessarily escape that. They can't get out of that. So you have to be able to kind of teach them how to find the, the, the nuggets that they can appreciate where they are. And if they aren't there, then, you know, as older college students, right, as future teachers, educators, doctors, whatever it is that you want to be, then create it, right, build it. And this is what, uh, Michael Danto talked about yesterday as well. Um, and I have an assignment where I'm asking my students to build out their superpowers. If they could counteract the narrative that they've been given, like how would they do that? Like what would be their superpower to help rebuild them? And there is on the larger list, there are graphic novels, um, there's young adult, there's children, so um, I try to I try to cover all kinds of um, audiences with this starter kit, and so um, the literature is there. It's just often um, buried, unfortunately. I had a quick question. So um, when it comes to where to start. Like categorically or topically, mm -hmm. which is better if you are a first timer into Afrofuturism? Because I'm seeing the contemporary writers in the 2000s, yeah. 
but yeah. I'm also seeing the anthologies yeah. um, as well. And then um, in the classics, we have something even going back to 98. So yeah. if you're a first timer, um, I am not asking for a friend, I'm asking for me. Um, I'm a first timer, Gen X, I think is my generation. I'm 95. Mm -hmm. Where is it best to start? to learn about the roots of Afrofuturism leading up to where we are now. Yeah, so I would start with an anthology, right? One of the ones that are listed here, Dark Matter, There's a there were uh, two offshoots to, do to Dark Matter, um, Octavia's Brood. And I say an anthology, there's another good one, um, Black Science Fiction, um, and I say anthologies because you get a little bit of everything, right? You get short stories, you get poetry, you get um, uh, critical essays, right? And so, and they're they're already kind of called together by someone in the field who says, based on what I know and what I do in this area, this group of readings is a is a good place to go. So, dark matter is especially good for that because it was the first one, right? So it had to kind of explain itself and show itself and define itself that very first time. Then I would say, um, you know, do it, it just depends. I'm a, I, I, I love novels, right? Um, I'm not so good with poetry, but there's some great poetry, um, Afrofuturist poetry that's out there. Um, but I would say, for a writer is Octavia Butler. I, I just, you know, she was the mother, <laughs> right? Um, and that's what that uh, Octavia's brood suggests, right? That this is the, this is the brood of, yes, right? That this is the brood of people, of writers, of thinkers, of feelers um, that she influenced. And as a result of her, you know, here we are, right? And uh, Mosley and Saunders in their essay, they're calling for, they're begging for Blacks to start reading and writing in science fiction. Octavia Butler didn't want to be the only Black female sci-fi writer, right? So I think she would, you know, love and appreciate. And so I would say it's anything by Octavia Butler, right? It's, you could start there. And then graphic novels, which is just something I love. I've been reading comics since I was a kid, playing Dungeons and Dragons and, and all that geeky stuff. Any more, are there any more questions? That is our time, but I just want to also thank that we have cited Dungeons and Dragons twice in this community over the last two days. Can we get a hey now? <laughs> this is community. <laughs> this is my tribe. Can we also give Dr. Clark a round of applause? I'm so appreciative of your presentation this morning. Thank you. You broke Thank it you. down.